It's 2012, and I'm working as a line cook in a small town in Italy. I have saute pans that are on every burner, and they're filled with garlic and tomatoes and proteins. And I have plates lined up, ready to be signed, different pastas. I'm standing in front of my fire, and I can hear tickets just spewing out, ticket after ticket. And I take a deep breath, and I think to myself, I've got this. Only 30 more minutes of service we can push through. And as I turn to plate a dish, a pan goes flying past me, knocking down all of my pans, breaking two of my plates, and knocking down all the spices on the shelf. My chef, that's chef with a capital C, is completely red in the face. And he's yelling at us, and he's telling us that we're slow, we're messy, and that we lack talent. And I look around at my team and I think to myself, if this man actually led, instead of yelling and throwing pans at us to move faster, he could have just communicated and shown us what he needed. Why did it have to be this way? I spent five years in Florence, Italy, and as much as I'd like to tell you that this is a one-time incident, it's just a window into a world that so many of us are enamored with. Many of us that have worked in this industry have stories, some beautiful, but oftentimes ugly. Abuse, wage theft, and sexual harassment have been going on for years, and it's only recently getting public attention. After my time in Italy, I spent two years in New York. And after working seven years as a line cook, the traditional chef culture started to wear me down. It was impossible to break through the hierarchy. And as a line cook, I felt more like a cog in the system. I showed up, I prepped my station, I followed the recipes, and I was expected to just keep my head down and not ask any questions of why things were the way they were. And I was surrounded by other people, part of this broken system, that hoped one day they too could be recognized. It felt that the people that were promoted weren't based on talent, but more on the abuse that they could endure. Once I was promoted to sous chef, I was rewarded by having to work six to seven days a week and 15 to 18 hours a day. And per the chef culture, I took on a lot of the chef's responsibilities without having any credit. The more that I pushed my body and the investment in the restaurant, the more responsibilities that I would take on. I was told that I needed to be tougher, that I needed to yell more, and that I needed to show my team who was boss. But I couldn't bring myself to do it. In my heart, I knew that there had to be a different way to run a kitchen. One that would nurture talent, create inspiring dishes, and treat each other respectfully. I wanted to run a restaurant, that was based on community, the same way that I was raised. I grew up in Seattle, where my family and my community proudly told me stories of Filipino food. And sharing food is our love language. My earliest memories of being in the kitchen was with my Lola, as she carefully seared her beef for her roast beef while sneaking candies to me from her secret drawer. I was so curious about the smells and the different ingredients, and I found myself asking my dad to show me what he was making. And so, I'd clean squid for the adobong pusit, and I'd cut veggies for punsit. He would never push me away or shout at me to get out of the kitchen. Instead, he leaned in 
and took it as an opportunity to be able to teach me about our culture and our food. He taught me that I could be successful by being prepared with the right ingredients and making sure that they were fresh. Our times together were full of love, joy, and laughter, and you could taste it in everything that we prepared. On the weekends, my family would get together and we would celebrate each other, eat, and offer each other support. A community-minded spirit was embedded in me from the start. So, with this in mind, I left New York, I came back to Seattle, and I started a monthly pop-up that was more than just about food. My friends and I wanted to create a really cool experience, and so we had DJs, we had live music, there were local artists selling their art, and I wanted guests to be able to experience the same hospitality that I grew up with. So, my mom would be walking around, scooping up extra rice on your plate, making sure that you were well fed, while my dad would be at the bar, buying you drinks, <laughs> and sharing stories about when he first moved to Seattle. This was more than just going out to eat at a restaurant. It was about being part of something, and it was about being part of a family. After three years, we knew that we needed to find a place to call our own home. Our restaurant is literally in a remodeled home in the heart of the community. It's a place for us to be able to usher in a new model, one that is based on mutual respect and empowerment. There would be no name calling, pan throwing tantrums, or abuse. Here, everyone's opinion would matter. Changes would be communicated and explained, and every worker would have the opportunity for mentorship and an equal chance for advancement. I never wanted to hear the words, yes, chef, again. <laughs> And I will tell you that the first month was really difficult. <laughs> Imagine spending the majority of your career being taught to act a certain way, and then having to relearn and train yourself in the complete opposite way. And it was an exercise in trust. Sean, who's one of my line cooks, expressed how disorienting it was for him, because he came from a kitchen just like me, where it was every person for themselves, He now had the opportunity to know what it meant to be part of a team. We grew from people that were fearful and competitive to one that wasn't afraid to voice their own opinions. By being open to constructive criticism about our operations and systems, we were able to run a smoother service. We developed our menus collaboratively, meaning my team and I would actually sit at a table and we would tell each other about our childhood memories of food. This wasn't about me having my name on a menu, it was about giving them an opportunity to tell their stories. So Kyle, one of my line cooks, would tell us stories about how his Lola would cook for him growing up and his favorite would be Seasig, so that we put that on the menu. Amelia, who's one of my pastry chefs, would tell us about eating bibinka during the holidays and how incredible the smell would be. So we put it on. Everyone on my team has the opportunity to develop their own palate, which is completely different from the traditional chef culture where you're expected to just keep your head down and not ask any questions. Instead, mentorship would be taught from the start. Our grand opening of the restaurant was January 2020, <laughs> which is considered to be the slowest month of the year. <laughs> but 
We had a line around the block. People waited three hours to have a seat at our table. (laughs) And we were packed for three months straight, serving our childhood memories of Filipinx food, like dinaguan and karakare and pork adobo and pancit. And we couldn't have been more proud as a team to share our stories because we knew we did it together as a family. And then the pandemic hit. (laughs) We didn't know it then, but this would be the truest test of the traditional chef culture versus the community philosophy. There were no chef leaders emerging to give advice about how to take care of our people, how to take care of our guests. Restaurants just shut down. And the people that were impacted the most were the ones that needed our help the most. So many people in our industry lost their jobs and they weren't given the resources or the tools to be able to navigate through unemployment. Jesse, who was my manager at the time, spent so many hours researching and contacting my entire team because we didn't want them to do this alone and navigate through unemployment without feeling like they could survive. And so we asked our community to donate to our staff relief fund, to donate to our community kitchen programs. And I applied to every single grant from the city of Seattle to make sure that we could still operate without being fully open. And I'm here to tell you that not only did we survive, but we thrived. (laughs) As we opened up phase by phase, we were able to bring back our team. Those that didn't come back, got other jobs, and moved out of the city. But we were able to take care of our team. As of today, I have 27 employees, which is more than when we first opened. (laughs) Our model showed that what's good for our people is also good for business. I am now able to pay competitive wages to both my front of house and my back of house. Working together as a team allows us to close the wage gap that has existed between them forever. Our model is based on tip pooling across the board, based on hours worked. I grew up in this industry without having proper health insurance, as most of us. And it's not because I didn't want to take care of my body. And that needs to change. And so we now offer health care, and we also pay 100% benefits to those that qualify. This is something that we need to put into practice because we need to know and be able to show our teams that they can and should take care of themselves. I was 36 until I could even think about retirement or contributions or savings. And it's not because I didn't work hard. It's just that this industry isn't set up to take care of people and their futures. And so now we offer a 401k with 2% matching. We may only be in year two of our restaurant being open, but I am here to tell you that this model works. Through the blood, sweat, tears, and sacrifices, our model works. And we shouldn't be the exception, but we should be the new norm. What the pandemic has taught us is that we need to take care of our people. It isn't enough anymore to keep opening up restaurants that just take up space and benefit off the labor of others without those laborers benefiting themselves. We need to stop uplifting the chef with a capital C 
because it's simply not sustainable. If we want to ensure the future of our industry, we need to make sure that we prepare the next generations with the right footprint and the tools to be able to ensure their successes. And in order for us to do that, we need to introduce a new model, one that is based on taking care of its people and building community. Thank you.